Oh, hi. This week, The Sun reported on the shocking news that the Great British Bake Off employs two professional writers to work on the show. The production company told The Sun that this is common industry practice. It is not. Take this show, for example. I not only present this show, I also write every single word. Yeah, it all seems fine. I think I'll just go down the pub. I also operate all the cameras myself. Hello and welcome to Sam Delaney's new thing. Thanks for joining me, panel. Work well, all the lights. You can probably still hear it somewhere. Direct the show from the gallery. Give me more Sam, more Sam, more Sam. Yes, yes. Edit it. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, classic me. And even work as my own runner. Where have you been? Takes 20 minutes to get a fucking latte, does it? Sorry. No, not good enough, mate. You're fired. Prick. What did you fucking say? Jesus. It's Saturday night. It's almost live. And it's right up a big tower in London's Westminster. It's Sam Delaney's news thing. Taking on Sam Superman this week. Kryptonite, it's Christian Wilmar. Socialite, it's Jermaine Greer. Gobshite, it's Michael Legg. Plus our special guest, the world's third most famous George, after Michael and Ad Asda. It's George Galloway. Hello and welcome to Sam Delaney's News Thing. Thanks for joining me, panel. Deep in the furthest reaches of space, you can probably still hear it somewhere. It's faint, but it's there. The echo of the sound our hearts made when they broke 20 years ago, when we first heard Princess Diana had died. There's probably an alien on a planet we've not yet discovered hearing that sound and saying to itself in its bleepy alien voice, she must have been some woman, that Diana, Princess of Hearts. And that alien would be right. She was some woman. She was the best woman that ever lived. She was Princess Diana. Princess Diana of Hearts. Princess Diana of Wales of Hearts. 20 years ago, the people of this great nation woke to the awful news Princess Diana was dead and felt the world's eyes upon London, even though it happened in Paris. We'll never know how she died because it was in a tunnel, but we shall never forget that day. In a way, we'd entered that tunnel with her, never to emerge. But we had emerged and she hadn't. The majority of us had to go to work, unless it was a Sunday, I can't remember. We were immediately plunged into an eternal mourning. It would take months to recover from. It was as if we'd lost a friend, except a friend who was a princess more famous than Michael Jackson and who we'd never met. Others, it was too late to say anything. I, I was looking at your, your bouquets there. Would you read what you've said on the card? What I've said on the card? It's not just what you've done for us that makes us love you so. It's all the joy of who you are, the friend we've come to know. No. Say. It's for sharing a common grief, a place just to be. Everyone she touched became a better person. It was as if her fingers had magic in them. Five little wands on each hand, ten in total. And that magic wasn't magic, like pull a rabbit out of a hat magic. That magic was kindness, or rather, the rabbit was kindness and we were the hat. Thanks to her, we were no longer scared to step on landmines. We were no longer afraid to visit seriously ill strangers in hospital. She shook hands with those that people wouldn't shake hands with before, taking all the stigma out of meeting Christa Berg. The term angel is bandied about all too loosely these days, but not when it comes to Diana. For Diana, you can't say the word angel enough. Angel, angel, angel. She was an angel. An angel sent from heaven to marry Prince Charles and be interviewed by Martin Bashir. No one shaped our nation like Diana. Sir Elton said it best. She lived her life like a candle in the wind. Getting blown about a bit and all covered in wax? I'm not sure. Though, of course, that wasn't his first attempt at rewriting the lyrics of one of his songs to pay tribute to Diana. His first effort was a version of I'm Still Standing, featuring the chorus line... Lovely princess, yeah, 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 which was ultimately only released as a B-side in Italy. Perhaps we'll never know what Elton really meant to say, and that's probably how she would have wanted it. Beautiful, kind, mysterious, magical Princess Diana, the angel who died. Panel, will she ever come alive again, Michael? 
Sorry, Princess Diana's dead. She's dead. Well, you know, we could have broken the news a little bit softer um, than that. I don't know what you've been doing for 20 years, mate. I... And I did tell the production team to brief you all on this to avoid any awkward situation. So, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to process this while we're recording. Jermaine, if Diana was still alive today, would she just be one of these people eating kangaroo penis and I'm a celebrity getting me out of here? I suspect not, actually, but it's interesting to think, would we still like her if she was 56? Mm. And I think we probably wouldn't. We didn't even like the Queen when she was 56. We don't like middle-aged women very much. How would Diana have middle-aged? I mean, what would the tally be of the men who dumped her by that stage? Be 40 or 50, probably. Mm. Worst fuck in the country, by all accounts. <laughs> is that right? I didn't know that. Is that is well, that? Well, you've got to move in special is. circles to um, be well, told clearly, this kind of thing. Yes. What we liked about Diana was she was a bit naughty. Mm. You know, she kind of slightly stuck it up to them, didn't she? Whereas Kate, you know, what would happen if Kate had a car crash tomorrow? I mean, God forbid. <laughs> what, do you think we'd be less upset than we were about Diana? I don't think she'd quite get the flowers. Uh, it, there wouldn't be as many flowers. The florists wouldn't be as it, hard It wasn't work. just that she was a bit naughty, Diana. It's that she fought for causes. She used her profile to, to yeah. raise awareness of important issues. We don't see Kate walking through Kabul with a bulletproof vest on, do we, Michael Lake? No, I mean, I suppose there's one similarity. I mean, yes, she does. She didn't go around hugging AIDS victims. She didn't mm. walk on landmines. But she has, uh, <laughs> you know, ended up fucking a very wealthy, ugly man. In that way, she is very similar so, to Princess There's something really important here. I mean, I think she's a smart woman married to a stupid man. That's, that's a tough road to hoe. Kate, Kate now? I'm talking about Kate. Even my godchildren wanted to be princesses, and they watched princesses on tape. They watched, they talked about them all the time. And I used to give them a lecture about how every princess they could think of was terribly, terribly sad. And that includes, especially, princesses of Wales. If you look at the history of princesses of Wales, it's a disaster course, mm. every inch of the That's way. Why Prince of Wales is always playing on another side as oh, well. Wales is a well, miserable place. Well, it was pretty place. bad for him. He was married to a woman he wasn't in love with and whom he didn't like. Do you think Diana was a good role model to young women in this country? <laughs> no. Why not? Well, because she was too dependent on the love of men, I think and she was prepared to humiliate herself to get it, and she blew it every time. I mean, it is such a catalogue of disasters, and your heart does ache for her. I like a vulnerable woman, personally. <laughs> so maybe that's why she was so popular, because a lot of us men do. I think, I think uh, yeah, that, it... that, was, that was greatly attractive, actually. That, yeah. that, there was something... Such, she, the way she sort of lowered her eyes when she was talking, you know, you think, you know, I, she's attainable. You know, that's what the me men thought. I think you're being that's a bit... That's Prince Charles thought. Yeah. She's <laughs> Prince Charles somehow <laughs> obtained it. Yeah. Yeah, how she manage it. Mm. Thanks, panel. Uh, here's one comforting thought for all of us consumed by grief for Diana. It won't be long before we're all as lovely and dead as she is. <laughs> Soon we can all join her in heaven, thanks to the impending nuclear Armageddon being schemed up by silly old Kim Jong-un of North Korea. We haven't heard much from old Kim in the few, last few weeks since he and Trump had a pissing contest over who was the more keen to use their world-ending bombs. But this week, he strode confidently back into the action by firing a missile over Japan. It didn't explode or kill anyone. It was a bluff designed to scare us, like when the school bully makes you flinch by raising his hand to slap you before casually sweeping back his hair and saying, why are you shitting it? Why are you shitting yourself? Why are you shitting yourself? He's going to cry. Look, why are you shitting it? Over and over again. What does the world do now? Stand there blinking, eyes filling up with shame and fear, trying to claim we are, in fact, not shitting it, but that we've just got something in our eye. That's what I did when Gary Price pulled that move on me outside the science sheds in 1987. I should have stabbed him with a compass. Then maybe Louise Thomas would have got off with me, and I wouldn't have been called shitbag Delaney for the rest of school. What can America and the world learn from my experience? Perhaps that they should drop a nuclear bomb on North Korea pronto. And perhaps they were close to doing so before Friday when North Korea blindsided their international enemies with a piece of militaristic propaganda so powerful and intimidating that it caused the global community to step back from the brink of war. Check this out. And by the way, this is an actual real clip that the North Korean government released this week.
Well, if we weren't scared before, we fucking should be now. <laughs> Once again, we have underestimated the North Koreans. I'd never have thought they could have pulled off a piece of musical theatre that polished. But there we have it. It takes a special sort of strategic genius to say to themselves, maybe if we can pull off a world-class song and dance routine, a show of pure <laughs> lazimataz, and no, Jermaine, that's not racist, that's how they say it, a show so powerfully dazzling, glitzy and rife with Broadway standard dance numbers, maybe, just maybe, then our enemies will back down. Question is, who is the magnificent master of razzle-dazzle, or lazzle-dazzle, who is pulling the strings out there in Pyongyang? Of the many theories online, the most convincing is that Bruce Forsyth faked his own death before defecting to North Korea to lend his light entertainment Midas touch to their deep Asian war machine. Well, now it's America's move. How do they hit back? In the only way Kim Jong-un and Bruce Forsyth understand. Dance. There are no books like a day. And nothing looks like a day. There are no drinks like a day. And nothing thinks like a day. Well, one thing's for sure, the only way to stop a nuclear war is by terrifying your enemy with a show of your force. And the best way to do that is with a closely choreographed tap dance routine and some truly excellent chorus line high kicks. In fact, some intelligence suggests that North Korea currently have the capability to launch a full-scale production of 42nd Street on the streets of Japan within just 24 hours. A truly chilling but all too real prospect. <laughs> Panel, should we be more terrified than ever Christian Mormer? Well, I think the problem is, is that Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump are the same person. I mean, they've both sort of got mother issues, according to Marina Hyde in The Guardian. Great piece, actually. Uh, they've both got too much hair, and one's just sort of a younger version of the other, but they're both completely bonkers. So, so yeah, I'm terrified. Mm, mm. It's very unpredictable, isn't it, at the moment, Jermaine? I'm a bit puzzled, because we can find people who've been missing for months in the desert and so forth. We can get messages from boats lost in the mid-ocean. Why can't we off this guy? Mm, what mm. is wrong with us? The Navy SEALs, you know, why can't they, like Jermaine says, Michael Legg, why can't they just jump him through the window and shoot him in his pyjamas like they did with Bin Laden? Or even shoot him while he's driving along in his car like they did with JFK? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think that might happen, though, mm. because I'm taking a lot of comfort from our, our, our beloved leader, Theresa May. Mm. Do you know what she said? It was amazing. She said, this is outrageous. That's what she said about the missile launch. This is outrageous. Kenny Everett is outrageous. Right? <laughs> this is a pretty much an act of war. But outrageous, she says. And I don't know. I, for one, take it all, great It almost sounds that. like a Kumlan. It's yeah. outrageous. Yeah. Oh, shut up. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. The trouble is, if you bumped him off, there'll just be another one. I mean, when he first came in, you thought, He's been educated in Switzerland. He sort of looks slightly cool with his kind of mad hair and stuff. You know, maybe he'll kind of get maybe all this. Maybe he'll be a and, liberal, yeah. Yeah, maybe he'll kind of say, OK, look, it's all a game, you know. No, I'm not going to be the, the great leader or whatever, the dear leader or dearest leader. I, I'm actually going to be a normal guy and we're going to open the place up and we're going to let people use the internet. Mm. But unfortunately, uh, he's worse than the others. So bumping him off, we'll just get another one. I wonder whether or not Kim Jong-il exists. Kim Jong-un, sorry, exists. Oh. Do you think he exists? Well, I, he exists mainly, surely, now, uh, so that the makers of James Bond films have to really up their game. Mm. Because now that we've got proper real-life cartoon villains... Yeah. I mean, what, what step has he come to make? Better than isn't yeah, it? Yeah, way better. <laughs> Thanks, panel. Coming up, Britain's best journalist, me, interviewing Britain's most gorgeous man, George Galloway. See you in a minute. Hey, welcome back. Now, if you're a kid, some cat under 16 watching this show, I want to take a couple of mins of your time for a chit-chat. That's cool, yeah? Don't want to be a hassle. Huh. Just been smoking a J out back as it happens. That sweet nutty puff takes me back. Reminds me when I was a runner on a little TV show you might remember by the name of Jules Holland's Hootenanny, 1996. Now I've earned your trust and respect, <laughs> kids, I want to tell you about something that's not as cool as me. This week, the Conservatives launched Activate, a new grassroots movement intended to appeal to the young. The Tories have traditionally done very poorly with voters under 75, but Activate are trying to change this by having a web page and using hashtags, just like young people do. It's a refreshing change of direction for the Tories, who previously had only engaged with the youth in more traditional offline arenas, like in a basement under Dolphin Square. 
The first thing Activate wanted us to check out was a meme which gave Jeremy Corbyn a sick burn. Now, the new statesman described using the picture of Admiral Akbar as an ancient creaking meme. And when the 104-year-old new statesman slating you for being behind the times, you know you're in trouble. But they didn't stop with references to 34-year-old film Return of the Jedi, no. Here are some more of their efforts at skewering Jeremy Corbyn and his cloud cuckoo land policies with red-hot memes like these blinders. I mean, what could possibly derail the Activate train? Well, sadly, within 24 hours of its launch, screenshots were leaked of the secret WhatsApp planning group behind the campaign, and it's every bit as thrillingly horrifying as you'd expect from a secret meeting of young Tories. Among some of the blue sky ideas that they ran up the flagpole were proposals to shoot peasants and gas the chavs. At one point, it threatened to be derailed by one of these tedious right on types who spoke up, say, careful, this is turned into a Nazi chat. However, this was quickly diffused by one of the more experienced Tories who shot back with, lol. Like any adults going online to try and connect with young people, this is at best undignified and at worst criminal. So, kids, if a cool dude in a suit who speaks like he's off Downton Abbey turns up at your skate park talking about public-private development and trying to get you to take off your T-shirt and put on a pinstripe shirt, you should immediately inform a parent that a Tory's trying to activate you. And before you know it, your dad will have called your uncles and they'll have made sure that hip Tory will be finding out what the NHS he hates so much looks like from the inside. Panel, have you ever been fiddled with by a Tory, Michael? <laughs> No, I haven't been. I but you grew up in Northern Ireland, Ireland where they're not allowed, are, are yeah, they? Yeah, no, we uh, we sort of avoided the right-wing politics by having far-right-wing politics. I just think, I know it's going to sound obvious, especially coming from a very old man like mm. me, but if you're young and you vote Tory, then you're wasting your life. It, it's like being young. This is how I can relate to the young people, yeah. It's like being young and listening to Mumford and Sons. You are wasting your youth. Yes. Yeah, that's all for the future, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, exactly. You've got who all was the it? to be boring. Was the phrase, Jermaine, go, if, if, you, if you haven't been a socialist by the time you're 20, you haven't got a heart. If you're still one after that, you haven't got a head. But really, if you're a Tory and you're under 21, you're really... I mean, there's nothing worse, is there, than a young Conservative? I think there probably are some things that are worse. I think an old Conservative might very well be worse. I just don't think they can talk to young people. They just can't speak the same language. So the idea that they could start this group from the top and bring it down like momentum, it just not, it's not going to work. They just must, give up they, they now. They must have at some point. I mean, the 1980s, but Thatcher captured young people's imagination, didn't she, Jermaine? The thing that impressed me, even as an undergraduate, uh, was that the Tories already had a system in place where you could aim for public office. And I saw, uh, for example, when I was at Cambridge, one of my friends was an assistant to a politician. Next thing I know, he's a parliamentary private secretary, and now he's in the House of Lords. And it just goes up like that. That's what they know how to do, and Labour has no way of, of offering that opportunity, which simply says, step this way and you'll end up in power. Mm. It doesn't matter what the power's for, we'll tell you how to get it. And this is a thing that, for example, as a feminist, I have to say women have no idea what power is and no idea of how to get it. You don't have to be a majority. Sometimes that's a real problem because you can't mobilise properly. You need to be a focused and clever minority that knows where the pressure points are and we've never known. We've never had a clue. Michael, the important thing, of course, is yeah. that um, memes are now dead because Conservatives have started using them. Yeah. Uh, and that ruins their credibility. Well, uh, I never had any, come on. You're, you're the youngest here. How on earth are young people going to communicate without memes now? Are they going to go back to letters? Yeah, I think go, they're going to go back to Latin, man. That's, oh, what, okay. that's what all the kids are into, mm. Latin. <laughs> Thanks, panel. <laughs> Now, uh, before we leave that topic, it's interesting because, of course, this isn't the first time that the Tories have tried to reach out to young people in a slightly awkward way. We've actually unearthed a fantastic piece of footage from one of their youth recruitment drive videos from 1987. This is real. Take a look at this. Drugs. Discos. Expensive sports shoes. You probably think it's all pretty cool. Hey, don't sweat. We all need to let off some steam. But let's talk about something you might not be hip to. A crazy new notion that means we can all do what we want all the time. 
I'm talking about radical free enterprise. Every man or woman doing whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and making a whole lot of this. I know. Your teachers told you you could never do anything in life without a lot of rules and red tape, that society doesn't want you to succeed. But what if I told you that society doesn't exist? And why should something that doesn't exist stop you from doing what you want? Society hates nothing more than brash, dynamic young people with thriving businesses and mature investment portfolios. That's why we're forming a club where exciting young guys like us can do our thing without the government getting in the way. So what's it going to be? Down the mines with your granddad? Or do you want to join Maggie's mates? Yeah, it was quite good. They gave me a badge and some stickers in the piggy bank. At the time, it just seemed normal. But... Oh, hi. Um, well, there we go. I'm now joined by our special guest this week, an MP synonymous with respect. He's gorgeous, he's outspoken, he's outspokenly gorgeous. It's Mr George Galloway. Hi. George, welcome back to News Thing. Good to be here. Uh, George, do you remember where you were when Diana died? I'm not accusing you, by the way, I'm <laughs> just wondering. I do. I was uh, abroad and I was woken up in the early hours uh, by my wife to say that uh, Princess Diana had uh, been killed and then the next thing I saw was Tony Blair in a perfectly scripted People's Princess moment. And that's when I knew that uh, New Labour was on top of this, definitely. Mm, interesting, that, wasn't it? It was a real watershed moment for Blair and... Uh, you Alistair know, sort of, Campbell, sort of, who wrote sort of, the words. Sort of launched his uh, golden age. And I'm sure you'll agree, George, it was at that moment when we all realised, you and I and everyone else, Tony Blair really is the king of our hearts, right? <laughs> well, he's certainly a ham, and uh, that's how it looked to me at the time. But you could say he found the words that most people were looking for that day. It was an extraordinary moment in British history where even people with nothing to gain from a monarchy, people with nothing, were visibly moved and touched by the death of a young woman who seemed so radiant just uh, a day or two before in the newspaper photograph. Perhaps it was the fact that, in a small way, she kind of undermined the monarchy with her rogue behaviour that people related to her so much. To some extent, she was, she was a rebel, and her death then contrasted, showed up the stuffiness and real uh, out-of-date conservatism of the family with which she was at war. George, who killed her? A drunk driver, I think. Nothing more uh, 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 sinister than that. There's no conspiracy there, I don't believe. Although there are millions of people... They're very who... popular conspiracy theories, though, aren't they? They are very popular. And, uh, well, about her, I mean. I mean, you don't, you're not convinced there are, by not them. Not at all, no. Uh, not everything in life is a conspiracy. That's not to say there aren't conspiracies, but I believe the toxicology report that the driver was stupid drunk driving too fast uh, through a tunnel. The idea that the Duke of Edinburgh, perchance, was at the head of a conspiracy to rob her out is completely fanciful, I think. Let's talk about your former party. There's no way you're coming back to the Labour Party, yeah. even if they asked you. Uh, well, you know my position, we discussed it before, my expulsion over the Iraq war has to be rescinded. If that's done, then I'm reinstated. I'm certainly not going to pen a, a letter of application. Uh, they should rescind it. It was unjust. And as the test of time is applied, everything I said about Iraq turned out to be right, and everything Blair and the Blairites said turned out to be wrong, except where it was a deliberate lie, it's definitely turned out to be wrong. So we'll see what happens after the Labour conference. There'll be a new... National Executive Committee in office, and we'll see what they decide to do, not just about me, but about many, many others who have been unjustly expelled from the Labour Party. Uh, let's quickly talk about North Korea. Kim Jong-un is, uh, you know, a rogue despot of a man. I think you can go and negotiate with him. Well, I don't know uh, about rogue. Despot, he undoubtedly is. Uh, you couldn't be the leader of North Korea and not be a despot. But I would say in this confrontation with Donald Trump, he's actually coming across as the more sane, uh, certainly the more diplomatic. And diplomatically, I think North Korea is running rings around the United States. 
I always said at the time of the Iraq war, Korea will never be invaded because it has weapons of mass destruction. Iraq will be invaded because it doesn't have weapons of mass destruction. And I think the truth of that is being borne out today. You famously met with Saddam and you've been prepared to sit down and break bread with people who are enemies of the West in, in the interests of, you know, diplomacy and, and, and engagement, right? I have broken bread with Tony Blair, you're, you're right. right. And so, uh, you know, but that's not possible with a man like Kim Jong-un, really, is it? Because there is, there is no roads into uh, that, that country. Well, um, Trump famously said just a month or two ago that he'd be ready to have a burger uh, with Kim Jong-un. And I think that direct talks, as China has said recently, and Lavrov uh, even more recently, sanctions have reached the edge of their limits. There cannot be a military confrontation with a country that borders Russia and China, both of whom have said they will not permit war to be unleashed on their neighbor. So that only leaves talking. And as Mr. Churchill, that famous Bolshevik, uh, famously said, jaw, jaw is better than war, war. So I commend uh, the idea of a burger with Kim Jong-un. Thank you, George, for joining us. Always a pleasure. Thanks also to my panel, Michael Legg, Jermaine Greer and Christian Warmer. Now, in a week when we paid heartwarming tribute to Britain's greatest ever lady, there's only one way to play out. Please welcome playing his original concept for a Princess Diana memorial song, Mr. Sir Elton John. Take it away. Mary Child's got it made. Walked into the lambs with a flow with ace. Danced with that Travolta in a pretty dress. Everyone was in agreement. She was a great princess. After Harry and Wills, it all went wrong. Thought she beat the king, but he was King Kong. He couldn't keep his hands out of Camilla's pants. And I went out with Dodie, and they drove through France. Don't you know that she's a lovely princess? Better we ever had. Better than Fergie. So we all feel so sad. Who's a lovely princess? May we ever be. She might be a dead, but in our heart, she'll always be queen. Lovely princess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's a lovely princess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 